Hello, everyone. If you're just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Making Democratic Tools Available for Everyone. I'd like to welcome Jonathan to the stage to introduce our next panel. Thank you all so much, and welcome again to Making Democratic Tools Available for Everyone. We're very lucky to have with us today as panelists Colin McGill, Victoria Alsina, Bill Warren, and Nick Mastronardi. By way of introduction, these folks have very long and accomplished accolades and bios, <laughs> so I'll try to be brief. Um, but Colin is an entrepreneur who builds tools that empower people to explore high dimensional spaces. From life sciences to democracies, he's worked with scientists at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center to build and design nextstrain.org, which won the 2017 Open Science Prize and is used by public health officials around the world to study virus evolution, collaborative collaboratively in real time. He's the CEO of Poll.is, the digital democracy and public participation uh, efforts of which were recently the subject of documentary programming by the BBC. And I've been featured in the New York Times, MIT Technology Review, The Economist, and so on and so forth. <laughs> He's a father and homeschool educator to three daring little boys. Victoria is an industry assistant professor and academic director at the NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress and senior fellow at the GovLab. Her current research and teaching focus on finding innovative solutions to rethink public institutions, exploring how collaborative governance and civic engagement can change the way we govern, solving our most pressing problems, and helping communities and institutions work together more effectively and legitimately. She advises governments, organizations, and private institutions. And at the Harvard Kennedy School, she's a fellow at the Mosavar Ramani Center for Business and Government, a democracy fellow at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, associate at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She holds many, many, many degrees <laughs> and has been a recipient of the prestigious Marie Sklodowska Curie Individual Fellowship. Bill is the co-founder of Peeps Democracy, Peeps created Peeps DAO, a cause-based decentralized organization platform for nonprofits, political organizations, and social movements. Peeps is working on a Peeps Vest, which will be a way for friends, neighbors, and strangers to save together for a shared goal or purchase, all while earning interests. Prior to Peeps, uh, Bill spent a few years in corporate law and political campaigns. And last but not least, we have Nick. Nick is an academic public servant technologist, served 10 years in active duty in the Air Force, on faculty at the Air Force Academy, a research physicist, technology program manager at the Air Force Research Laboratory, in the Pentagon, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and in the White House on the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Nick is still a reservist for the United States Cyber Command and has led projects for Amazon as a senior economist, before returning to the public sector mission and founding Polco. Again, Nick has many, many, many degrees <laughs> and current role is leading a talented team of technologists and industry experts at Polco and NRC to better connect local leaders and constituents through policy polls, surveys, civic dialogue, and performance data. So with that, welcome Colin, Nick, Bill, and Victoria. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs> Wonderful. So to begin, um, the idea of making democratic tools available to everyone is a fairly new phenomenon. Um, would love to go around and have you share what you think the driving force has been behind this movement towards increased cooperation and sharing of information to solve public problems. Feel free to chime in as you'd like, but we can start off with Colin. Sure. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways that citizens are now connected to governments. There's a, there is an, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have at this very moment lost the, the name of the application. This is a bad start. Um, there are a number of applications, for instance, for pointing out potholes or other things that need to be fixed around a city. And so I think I'll start with the easy one, which is that citizens are willing to give up information like 
a photo that they just took, which is data from their phone, um, if, it, if they feel there's some immediate benefit of improving their community. So that's the easy one, but also I think it provides a foundation um, to begin an interchange uh, over digital media between citizens and local governments. Uh, C-Click Fix, there you go, I found it. Found the, found the name there. C, C Click Fix is the name of that one. And that was a, that app, I think, grew to you know, some thousands of US municipalities. Absolutely. John, yeah. yeah John, John, I'll jump in. Uh, so I think this is a especially exciting period in time for use of technology to improve resident or citizen communication with governments. Um, I mean, I just think technology in general just underwent a massive revolution, right? I mean, since since the dawn of the printing press, which was the introduction really of point to mass communication just in general, uh, major communication innovations since then have all just been improvements on point to mass, whether that be radio or media, I mean, radio or television. And with the internet now, it's a this is for like the first time we can do mass peer to peer uh, communications and the implication of that in our public policy uh, means that, well, first, uh, prior to that, it was, it was while there's just too many uh, things going on at all levels of government for any individual to stay fully abreast on uh, and be able to provide meaningful input. And so, you know, 10,000 U.S. federal bills a year, tons of state bills, local issues, all of them subtle and complex. And for you as a resident to be able to pay attention to all of those and provide input would have been overwhelming. And just how do you even provide input in a referenceable way? And so now for the first time through the internet, if you want to, you could follow the complexities and the details of tons of these things. And now you could also interact with your peers. Not that we've done this elegantly. You know, we've shoehorned traditional social media tools into it, whether it be Facebook or, you know, even a survey monkey or, or whatever. And I think that um, the political polarizations, the political lack of participation uh, have kind of just been exacerbated by our initial use of shoehorning traditional tools. And uh, so I do feel like technology's initial impact has exacerbated problematic trends, but I also feel that the technology uh, has the capability for people to learn from each other. Like there's reasonable people on both sides of the aisle. There's reasonable people on both sides of you know each position, but it had previously been difficult for them to learn from each other, interact with each other in a civil way. Um, and initial solutions only brought them together in the most uh, hostile because of the algorithms. And so um, the, the problems that were exacerbated by technology are also the problems I think can be fixed. So. It's just, sorry, it's, it's kind of high level, but it's why it's an interesting point um, now where we are, whether we can fix our problems before we uh, make them too severe. Mm. Building, building, building on what uh, Nick and Colin just said, so I think that the big question, now we have a lot of experiences going on around the world, but we need to, to better learn how to create uh, meaningful conversations through these current opportunities that we have. And when reviewing what is going on, if you ask me, um, I see four limitations that can be easily transformed in four um, great opportunities, right? To improve this, this uh, conversation, this public conversation. So the first one, at least from the public institutions um, perspective, we focus it too much in using these processes to build legitimacy, and that's great but we also should focus in, in building efficiency because this is one of the best legitimations also that we can find to support those. The second limitation probably is that we focus it too much in asking people's opinion. And again, that's great, but we should learn how to better use the expertise for policy making, the expertise that we all have in, in different dimensions. A third limitation is that we ask a lot of times which is the problem or which is the solution but we don't ask people to evaluate what they think about what we did in the past. We don't use them to co-implement things. We can expand then the moment in the policy, so policy making cycle in which they, they intervene. And finally, and probably this is one of the most important ones, we need to learn how to listen to them. Because if you feel that you are using your time and the institutions are not listening to you, 
this is what uh, doesn't encourage you to participate again. Yeah, and that, following on what Victoria said, I, I think we're seeing this kind of Cambrian explosion of gov tech and political tech tools that are trying to increase the power of the populace to communicate with their governments, to have meaningful change, partially because the tools that we've tried thus far haven't been very effective in moving the needle. I mean, just in the past few weeks, we've seen people kind of taking to the streets once again in the context of a pandemic even because they feel that pro in-person protesting is still one of the more effective ways of communicating their displeasure to their elected representatives. And, you know, that, that comes from a lot of these tools have done a great job of helping people find peers that believe in their set of beliefs or communicating to the government what the people feel, but haven't done a great job of making the government greatly more efficient or greatly more responsive to what the people think. And until I think we see tools being effective on those two fronts, we're still seeing a lot of, exper we're going to see lots of experimentation and lots of different approaches, which is not a, a bad thing. You know, we're, we're kind of in the course of human history, still in the early days of the internet and, and MySpace and blockchain technology. And so we're still trying to figure out how can we use this new kind of communications technology to really create a more democratic society and a more responsive society until we find something that's really effective as a model. Um, we're going to see a lot of people trying different things. Now, as we go, I would love it um, for you all, because you all are just leaders um, in your own domains and spaces, to so just help ground it in concrete, tangible, everyday instances of either the projects you're working on uh, or in just the applications for, again, what can be a really theoretical notion. Um, and would love to go around again. We can go in reverse order or whoever would like to jump in. But in really, A, driving forward, how we can um, how we can direct this movement towards decentralization in the public sector um, and avoid that potential um, slip, that, that integration with centralized power. Um, and then again, if you can ground that in a concrete sense of what is a citizen interfacing with this tool look like um, and why would it matter to them in that use? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there because- Please. Yeah, that, that's what our technology is very focused on, is decentralizing kind of public goods and- Could you say the name of your technology so that we're all just, yeah. in case everyone's not familiar? Yeah, so we're building a platform at Peeps Democracy, which is my company that uses blockchain technology, specifically the Ethereum network, to allow people to coordinate funds, cryptocurrencies, in a trustless and decentralized way. And I think, you know, what we're really trying to do is give people at this point, almost an alternative path to government institutions, because you can create your own mini communities on our platform and start to pool funds towards a cause or even a shared purchase that you care about, and then democratically deploy those funds in what we call a trustless way. You have to trust the community members to some extent in terms of mission, but certainly everything's transparent because it's done through blockchain-based voting. So you can see how everybody votes, how the decision was made, where the funds were released, what funds went in, how people got their votes. All of that's incredibly public, even though kind of on a identity front, it can be pseudonymous. You know, and I think those tools right now are seen more as an alternative to government. You know, we're using them also with nonprofits, which have <laughs> stepped into the role of government. And a lot of places this government has backed off some of the kind of social programs of the 60s as well. But, you know, our hope long term is that you can apply these same tools within government so that at a future state, local or state governments could allocate a portion of their budget to these decentralized autonomous organizations give every citizen 
in their polity a vote and let them allocate a portion of budget funds towards priorities that they think are important. Have you worked, uh, have you, have, have there been any participatory budgeting efforts that have involved um, crypto? I actually, I'm, 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 un, I'm un, sure. <laughs> no, really follow that. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> uh, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I think there's lots of potential for it. Just governments um, still have a lot of onboarding to do when it comes to crypto. Uh, but it's, it's a perfect use case and there's a great tool set out there that's in its infancy, but will be developed further. And one last question. How do you think participatory budgeting exercises would be different with crypto than without? So it, I think what cryptocurrency and blockchain can add is an additional trust layer, right? Because the decision-making is in code on the blockchain for anybody to see. So there was an example of a small town in New Jersey did like a very small participatory budgeting program for something like $50,000 of funds. And of course they used SurveyMonkey, which meant that anybody could participate. The results weren't very public. You couldn't see how the voting was calculated or who voted. Blockchain puts all of that out in the open so that you know people really have a sense of how the decision was made and how funds are allocated. Mm -hmm. in a highly transparent way. Trace, traceability. Right, yeah, traceability, transparency. And it also allows you to kind of play with different types of voting, like quadratic voting is a perfect thing that you can easily play with using blockchain-based voting systems. Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in uh, next, or Victoria, if you like, if you want to continue the reverse order. I can jump in with with a couple with a couple of comments. Um, I should say that these are comments that um, are more like questions for all of you because I'm very much interested knowing your backgrounds to also have your views about about this, right? So um, technology is not neutral, and I think, like Bill said, that any technology that is super transparent is the best way to really integrate the requirements that we need when we apply this into the public sector, right? And, and considering that, um, so my two questions and my two points, so I think that in this kind of conversations, moderation, how we moderate the conversation is a key element for, for its success. And then my question is, how do you think um, that we can promote an effective moderation, even using these tools that are transparency, use blockchain, uh, take the best from, art from artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we do this moderation? And also another point that I think is interesting is um, how we can integrate the public leaders or um, the people working in the public sector in building these technologies, because sometimes they can allow to anticipate some of the problems that these technologies may find when we try to apply them that's to for the sure. Council, <laughs> to the Congress, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I, I will be keen to also know your, your opinion on those two things. Yeah, and I can chime in real quickly on the kind of moderation, right? We're playing with, in the blockchain community, permission chats so that you issue a non-fungible token to people. And if they have it, they can participate in a chat, which is a way to kind of make sure that you know, the community, for instance, everybody in a chat about a town's budget, you could verify that they're a member of the town, give them a token, and that way you don't have kind of just like outside interlopers trolling the chat. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a great kind of like focus to have when figuring out how to create kind of spaces for meaningful conversation. I have something to add there in our experience. So we, we've done, the one that comes to mind are some of the city scale, um, the city scale conversations that we've done in the United States with uh, US public media and NPR stations. One of the things that we've been really inspired by uh, are the, the focus and intention that public um, independent news organizations and just the people behind them have um, around the editorial and ethics considerations around moderation. We are not, a, Polis is not a forum, Polis is a, a 
manner of gathering people's um, statements in their own words where people submit statements and then they go back out randomly and people read screen pass and then we run um, statistics on the revolting matrix. But that it is to say that, you know, sometimes we have, if we're running a conversation at, at um, UK, you know, United Kingdom scale right now, and, and there are thousands upon thousands of comments. And so you need a rubric to which ones you're going to allow in and which ones you're not, because people do submit things that are nonsense or hateful or just obviously not, um, uh, not going to be sent back out um, under the, you know, under NPR's, um, under NPR's brand or another you know, foundation's brand or something like that. And so the, um, I think moderation by humans is still an important um, factor, even if we're even if we're in a town, there's still a lot in that town that may need to be moderated. Um, and we we had kind of started out as well, considering sending and you know a token or a, a basically a, like a long um, single use URL. Uh, and we've done that. We've done like mass email lists where you know they'll be like a poll provider. You'll send out um, one one use token uh, invites. And people come in, and then you know, the token explodes, and they're able to just participate in that once. And that's just done on a server, you know, no, nothing, nothing fancy other than a database and a server of you know pre pre um, pre authorized uh, tokens. But uh, that, on the other hand, you know, I think again, the thing that I've been most inspired by are processes, which are not government process, not government based deliberative processes, but those who have professional facilitator because they're trained facilitators or those who have facilitation um, because they feel a, um, a mission level mandate to facilitate the uh, public dialogue at, uh, at the scale at which they operate, like to say Kansas City's NPR station or you know, San Francisco's NPR station. They feel uh, a part, as a part of their mission to uh, maintain an, um, a, a hand in, in facilitating the public conversation. And yet, because of toxicity, they shut off comments. And so just ha knowing that people are within the bounds of the city, you know, assuming all of the people that they shut off comments for were people who were also interested in, in issues in that jurisdiction, you know, I, I think there, there is still a role for humans in the loop for that. Um, fascinating questions, awesome topics, awesome examples, uh, really cool, fascinating uh, technologies. We have a, a similar but slightly different approach. So I run two companies. One is National Research Center, and it's uh, mostly uh, annual surveys, benchmarking performance surveys for cities. And uh, most of it's random sample, but then we do also an, uh, an online opt-in, hear from everybody that we can. We apply some heck of statistics uh, to correct for selection bias and, um, and blend results as necessary. And, uh, those are traditional surveys. How satisfied are you with service deliveries from your government? And, right. Um, but on the more technologically advanced front, we also run uh, also run the company Polco. Uh, it stands for Policy Confluence or Political Compass. Help people kind of navigate what's going on, and uh, we try to be little more than a survey monkey. And so, to I think it was Bill's original point, right? Like. We're at a stage now uh, to succeed in delivering tools to improve how residents and government officials come together. You have to be both partially GovTech, and by GovTech, I mean like you're delivering value to the government official, right? This is that you're, you're building a marketplace for interaction between both sides, of two groups who largely are under communicating right now. And so you got to make sure you're delivering value to the government official. You need to make sure you're also delivering value that's CivTech to the resident participant. Um, and so the way we do this is we let the government official easily post a survey or a poll um, like you might on SurveyMonkey, but also include lots of relevant background material. So a resident ultimately will see three things. They'll see the official background materials, the renderings of the new path or the park or the road um, or the new program, whatever it is, uh, the costs and trade-offs, bike lanes versus uh, bus or rapid transit. And so that's really helpful for them to set the narrative and to ask the questions that they want. Uh, and then for the residents, they see that data, but we also let participating residents provide their own commentary. And the way that we do this is, and again, this is similar to the theme of technologies created these internet commenters, but technology also has the ability to moderate decently. If you take a look at examples like Stack Overflow or even Seeking Alpha, and if you do some quality crowdsourcing and moderation on those comments, you can get pretty far. And so what we do is you can only comment uh, if you provide input. Uh, respondents, we cross-reference respondents on local voter files. 
you don't have to be a registered voter to participate. But if you do, then you can count. Uh, a government official never sees an individual's vote, but they can filter the results to just those who are matched as registered voters. And they can be more confident in those sets of results that those are people within the specific jurisdiction or who voted no more than once. So we kind of put those tools in the hands of the government officials. And it's a decision then by the resident, you know, do I want to provide a phony name or will I provide my real name and I'll trust Polko's privacy and protections that they won't share this individual data. I, I mean, I could still go to a city council as a resident if I want to, or we're giving you the option to provide, you know, with the ease of a survey monkey with, with verification. Uh, so after you vote, uh, you can also provide a comment. You can associate your name if you'd like to, um, and, but your comment gets organized by what you voted, yes or no, or if it's a multiple choice, uh, which option. And then you can only interact with the other comments from your position. So you can only upvote what you think are good comments. And so then you can't go over and troll other people, call names and upvote bad arguments from the other positions. And so we think this is just as valuable as the government's provided official background materials for the residents to see the peer-to-peer -peer commentary that has been upvoted. Everybody who was for, what did they think really was the strongest position for? And this, this tries to fuel and to foster rational debate. So somebody who's genuinely curious and wants, who may have voted yes, but wants to learn the best reason against can find why all the people who voted against thought were the strongest arguments and potentially most compelling. And so it's, it's not you know, brand new. This is very similar to Reddit, uh, just tailored to the civic environment, very similar to Stack Overflow, but tailored to the civic environment. And of all the cities that we provide this tool to, hundreds of cities uh, across 40 states in the United States, um, we and tens and tens of thousands of comments being cast on all these issues we have had less than three uh, comments that we've had to redact. Uh, and it's just been fascinating with that little bit of structure in the commentary system, just how civil, how constructive, uh, how rational it's been. I'm not, you know, not perfect. It's early days. We're ready to react and, and iterate with it, but it's been really kind of uh, affirming for us. And so um, I'm going to provide you specific examples, but a high level, that's uh, kind of how we aim to address uh, the problem and fortunate for the uh, for the success it's had on that front. Absolutely. This is very apropos. Uh, we have a question um, from an audience member um, about how do how we avoid, uh, to quote them, propagating existing inequalities with these proposals, for example, as they translate into access and time to, to participate in democratic systems. So one example, uh, you know, I'm based here in New York and it's well known in the community board system, which determine uh, regulations like zoning, um, the folks who participate in the zoning deliberations uh, in the community board meetings are unrepresentative of the communities. And then for years, for decades down, the investments and developments decision tend to reflect the skewed preferences of those who participate. And this is particularly stark of, of an issue here in New York where you have um, luxury vacant housing developments on one side of the street and crumbling public housing on the other. Um, so yeah, I mean, how do, you, how do you bake this into your design, into your thinking, um, and how do we avoid the replication or exacerbation of the existing inequities? I, um, I mean, I could jump in really fast. That's a great point. Uh, one of our, our favorite things about the process that we use with that voter file verification for those who choose to verify, uh, that comes with it. Um, you can see the real-time participation rates by age, by gender, by ethnicity, um, and you can check that inclusivity. And so we always say, right, what gets measured gets fixed. And under traditional means of participation, maybe it's slow or the data isn't there. And you don't know if the people at that council meeting are just the ones who happen to have the evening free, or you're not getting people who live far from council chambers. Uh, who work third shift um, or, you know, just feel intimidated in the environment. But online, you like democratize access, but then you also are providing real-time data dashboards of participation rates by who's there and who's not there. And the fact that it's real-time means if the government is feeling that the participation is not representative and they, they do have this desire to improve inclusivity, they then can adjust their outreach. And they can go in person with iPads or tablets 
uh, and try to get input or do uh, mail multi-mode. Uh, we do that and then we weave it in. So we do everything that we can to try to include uh, people, but also then to make sure that the officials have real-time dashboards of the quality uh, and the representativeness of that participation. It's a, it's a great question. Um, that, that's how we approach that, that topic. I, I jump in with a couple of, um, a couple of comments here because this is of course this is the question this is the question and i entirely agree that this can amplify what is already a reality of who participates also when 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 we go physically to to do that so uh, a couple of comments so one fast solution for that is for some concrete processes you can um, establish representative panels of people participating online so you can force at some point this diversity and the key thing is when you need to do that, right? And we have plenty of examples of representative uh, panels at different city councils started to, to promote. And, and uh, so this is one fast solution to force that there is diversity, right? The key element, however, thinking in a long-term solution from my understanding is expanding the competences and um, that people need to do this kind of participation because, of course, it's competences and, and resources to do it. And this is the reason on the resources side that a lot of apps decided to be mobile apps because more people use mobiles than computers. And that's, that's clear, especially in other countries around the world. And, and, but competences are, are important and competences for users and competences for civil servants also to promote that. So training is a fundamental piece there. Yeah, and certainly in the blockchain crypto space, we have not done a great job with accessibility. Um, some of that is due to government regulations, right? Like an easy on off ramp from crypto to fiat is dependent on state based money transmitter licenses. And the existing banking structure has made it very hard for crypto to become a new entrance and really kind of provide better and cheaper financial services to the underbanked. And then kind of on a systemic level, the crypto blockchain space came with this ethos of, you know, more radical self-reliance and realignment and democracy. But in effect, you ended up with a lot of plutocracy, a lot of kind of wealthy, smart people becoming even wealthier. <laughs> uh, so- I And central exchanges. I mean, the, right. you know, the, the free and free to lose your money if you keep it on your laptop was almost immediate, right? So right. It's, you know, it's not just a victim of regulation or plutocracy, but also individuals make voting with their feet to not keep stuff on their laptop. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there, there are a lot of places and there's a long, that we haven't done great and there's a long way to go. You know, one thing that we are focused on at Peeps, because our mission is very much about letting people kind of pool money around cause-based efforts, is we're going to communities of color or communities overseas where they haven't had an easy time with the current banking system and trying to listen to them trying to take the time to help them figure out how to onboard onto crypto and spend that like 15 minutes. That's really a, a pain, but once you've done it, the whole kind of crypto blockchain world has opened up to you. And for us, because it's so early days, it, it's very much still like, a, you know, going to communities, trying to meet them where they are, helping to educate and onboard. And it, we don't have a really great scalable solution for that yet. But we think it's important that, you know, for these democratic tools of the future to work, there has to be outreach and effort from the companies that create them to make sure that nobody's being left behind. We've had an experience with certain organizations using two, two ways to, to get it more representative. Um, one is using a polling provider to ensure that the sample is um, intentionally uh, chosen to be to be that um, and the, and in that case it's actually you know active incentive of, of usually polling providers are paying people um, the the other hand on the other hand uh, 
also using advertisement, you're using online ads to um, to just go out to people and, and then kind of try to demographically balance from, from groups that they're not getting as many as they wanted. Yeah, but I agree. It, it's that it's I that is to say I agree that it's an active step. Uh, right now, there's no. Um, it's not going to be balanced if you just throw something out there and and you know. In fact, if you just do that, even at nation scale, it's probably going to be 100 people. Right. So I want to bring in one other question from, um, from the audience as well, integrate it. Um, this is from, from Henry. Um, how do we encourage nonpartisan participation? Uh, for example, integrating ideas and views from the quote, other side. Um, and I suppose this wraps in um, as well to the broader context of what is the end goal? What is, what is your vision? Um, is it transforming the systems of government uh, entirely, uh, a restoration of civility? Um, what, what is the um, vision? And integrating Henry's specific question of encouraging this less polarized nonpartisan participation. I can start on that one. For sure. So, I don't think that the civic technology community is aiming high enough if it isn't aiming at the political party itself. Hmm. The political party as a mechanism for reconciling people's opinions and perspectives and interests uh, into a platform that's electable, I think that's something that remains relatively unchallenged, even in concept in the civic technology community. We just assume that that's there. I mean, one of my favorite pages on the, one of the strangest pages on the internet uh, is if you go to, if you Google DNC, right, and then you go to the Wikipedia page for Democratic National, you know, uh, uh, you'll, you'll click through to a page on a cor cor uh, listing, corporate listing, and it's like, you know, uh, the, the, the corporation, for, you know, the Democratic corporation, you know, from, uh, from Jefferson through present, there's been a will to bring people together. It's just like so completely bizarre to see them as a corporation, uh, but of course they are, and they have no, um, they, they stay. Uh, you cycle through, cycle through the electeds, and the, the, that governing body, of course, stays behind. And the, um, this is a, a means of reconciling people's opinions uh, and a means of rec reconciling complexity that, that, by, that there's, there's no way to get around the fact that everything concentrates in the presidential elections and all of the issues are bundled together. That is to say, you're always and only operating on thousands of uh, issues uh, simultaneously. We have, to, we have to say, what do you think of Syria four years ago? What do you think of the economy today? What do you think of race? What do you think of the environment? You know, we have many of the issues, if you take uh, one at a time, as I'm sure um, Nick, uh, Nick, Nick would attest from his polls as well. Um, if you take issues one at a time, you're willing to, you're going to find a, a Quite a bit of willingness to to uh, to move and movement. If you take if you take you know um, a, a ten thousand issues simultaneously, you're you're gonna you're gonna find that that uh, that average polarization. And so you know, the any any of the hot button issues, um, immigration, uh, you know, especially if you if you if you decompose them not only to that one issue area, but then into their own into their their individual issues, there's an enormous enormous complexity and diversity in the population and that's generally hidden and so I think that the I, I think that there's no there there is no way from my perspective to continue um, in what with Western democracies as the party uh, as the unit of abstraction and in other words the you know if we want to have a new issue area like uh, you know, we have to have the Justice Democrats or the Tea Party or we have to have the Green Party except that these organizations that have to take positions on 10,000 other issues, which they don't, and they're not viable, and et cetera. So even with ranked choice voting, even with multi-party democracy, I think we really don't we really don't actually get there until we have um, you know a, we have uh, legislatures that are full of independence, and then we are, we are we have processes which reconcile their opinions outside of their um, uh, uh, outside of that outside of the the structures of, of just elections, you know, and and the. This does call for um, our governing bodies and institutional, um, the institutions which currently exist to take much more seriously the role of deliberation and a process uh, in a more transparent manner. Uh, and this is something that has, this is not exercised uh, in, in, in every Western uh, democracy. We have, we have uh, a dominant trend of, of more, um, 
intra-party decision-making where whoever's in power um, uh, is able to sequester deliberation to the interior of that organizing structure. And so it, those have to be made out, you know, take that inside space and make that the public deliberation space again. And that's not just taking back, but taking back the parties. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's removing them as the dominant mechanisms for reconciling complexity. Yeah, and just to jump in really quickly there, you know, to Colin's point about civic tech not reaching high enough, I think a big problem is that a lot of civic tech is funded by political parties or supporters of particular political parties. Some of it. Yeah, right. Not, not all of it, <laughs> but um, if you look at a lot of the major funding sources, right, there are a number of civic tech companies that are out the gate building for a particular party, which is a problem. And, you know, I, I hope that more and more civic tech is funded by nonpartisan sources. You know, we're working on like a decentralized civic tech funding platform ourselves. Um, and then to the second point about parties, you know, it it's a lazy heuristic. I'm a registered Democrat and I tend to vote for other Democrats when they run because kind of like Colin was saying, I know I have a high confidence that they probably agree with me on like 70 to 80% of the issues I care about. And until we have a better system for breaking issues away from people, right? Yes. We're going to have to rely on these kind of heuristics because in a representative democracy, when I'm voting for somebody, I can't decide that I like X candidate for their stance on seven issues and Y candidate for their stance on three and have them be elected into the same seat, right? So, you know, at PEEPS, we've really tried to focus on particular causes so that we can mm -hmm. pull people back to issues and causes and not focus so much on parties. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're not going to see the death of the political party unless we really kind of radically reimagine how representative democracy is done in the United States or elsewhere. We agree on both counts. Yeah. One of the one of the, the, the things about V Taiwan that and, and the Taiwanese um, efforts that we we've been you know a part of and involved with for six years now, I, I suppose it is. I think is overlooked as an assumption is that V Taiwan handled one issue. That's profoundly different. And that's not how we engage the public usually. We usually, if we're engaged the public in elections, we're engaging them on thousands of issues. And suddenly there were all sorts of complexity and all sorts of, of room. And you know, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the, the nature of, the, of, of that bundling and that averaging of polarization. We average polarization over thousands of issues. And yeah, you get two peaks. You know, but if you disaggregate it, in fact, you need thousands and thousands of, uh, of, 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 of interest areas and subgroups on various issues that we simply don't give any daylight to in our delivery mechanisms. Indeed, when, when you review, and this is something that we have been doing these past few years from, from the GOP lab at NYU, we, we have been reviewing um, how consul um, has been applied and used for public debates, debates in, in different countries in, in Europe and, and Latin America. And when you ask the right question, the level of polarization that, that you really find is so low. Yes. You don't need to, you, you don't need to, to, to moderate a lot if, if you properly frame what you want to obtain from, from the public, right? And I, I want to put one concrete example. For example, in Chile, we have been working uh, with the Senate. They created this platform to ask questions to citizens uh, more than 10 years ago. It was pretty new when they did it. And um, they were, um, I don't remember now the, 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 the concrete number, but they were sharing with us the number of really citizen comments that they needed to delay in all these 10 years. And I think it was less than 50. So it's, it's quite surprising when you frame well the question. I, um, I agree with everything that's been said and uh, you know, it harkens back to kind of my opening comments, right? Like parties were a natural proxy for when there were so many issues going on that's and right. the inability to keep up with it. It's that's just right. A, 
a way you organize. But now as there's more questions and there's more data and you can participate more frequently, mm -hmm. um, I, I think there will be a, a thaw uh, on that front. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that, you know, it's one of the, we see this also in the U.S. at the local level. That's why we really love our work at the local level. Um, most mm -hmm. of the U.S. local level work is nonpartisan. Yeah. Um, right. We have two options Cable on the road. Or, <laughs> Cable um, yeah. yeah. And um, and I think not only as you ask more questions, but as you get more data, people are going to just want to see ROI. Uh, it doesn't yeah. matter. And I think the the other interesting impact is not just on parties, but on the role of the elected. I think that technology is going to cleave electeds two ways. Right. If you are a passive or scared elected. Uh, you will probably end up just becoming a panderer or reactive respondent to what your constituents seek. Maybe that's good. Depends on your constituents. Depends on the framework and how they're getting in their information. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, right, like if the information is not perfect and you feel, you know, you genuinely believe that there's other factors at play here, it allows you as elected to really become a leader and to influence uh, that conversation. And so I think that any elected who's kind of in between those two roles, as technology becomes more prominent in public participation, uh, you're going to have to pick a path. Uh, is this something you really believe on? Well, then really lead on the issue. And if not, mm -hmm. uh, then listen uh, to the crowdsourced input coming from out there. It'll be fascinating to watch. It'll be exciting. Yeah, I agree. Great. So I'm just mindful of the time and want to put out um, a final integrated question drawing from a couple of questions um, from, from the audience. It, it seems there are many, many forks presenting themselves. Um, one, one route we see is the techno authoritarian enabled regime. Mm -hmm. um, one other route is you see um, the Western liberal democracy attempt which if you look at the COVID response, you might say has been an abject failure um, and just uh, a, a chaos, just an absolute chaos and a failure um, to respond and to manage. There's also another fork that's been proposed of government in Taiwan um, as a way forward of creating and replacing government tools. Um, one other focus, uh, folks um, have, have proposed liquid democracy as a tool. Um, and wanted um, y'all's thoughts. Um, and then to the point um, that Nick just brought up, um, it really brought to mind Twitter and the use of Twitter in the public sphere today, where if you look at the data on Twitter users, 79% um, of Americans aren't on Twitter. Um, and even among those who tweet, um, it's something like 20% um, of those who tweet um, produce 80% of the tweets. Yeah. So when, when Twitter is then used as this representative sample to determine public policy or Who's doing that, that? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, again, a, another fork in the road um, that's been implemented um, yeah. to some effect in, in the public sphere. So given all these forks and uh, given uh, the challenges presented, um, would love to give you all a chance to conclude and close and reflect and offer your sense of the way forward. Yeah, I, I can say I hope it's definitely not techno authoritarianism. Um, and I think, you know, Western liberal democracy can include tools like liquid democracy, delegated voting, you know, better responsiveness through technology. It's just we need leaders with the political will to do that. Um, I agree. I think there's uh, there's some really cool uh, options in there. One of the ones that I love, uh, and that when we started building Polka, we never really saw this, but we found it in communities across the country that some communities actually were doing really good um, engagement with their constituents about, uh, hey, how satisfied are you with the service delivery? And people would weigh in, but it would stop there. So people were ultimately feeling disenfranchised because they were helping identify problems, but they weren't part of the solution. This gets back actually something Victoria said early, um, right? Are you asking for a problem? Are you asking questions? Are you asking for solutions? And, and it was also interesting too, because Victoria, you mentioned on uh, these digital panels and the opportunity now, right, to do digital panels um, and maintain that persistent relationship and that dialogue and do it throughout the policy lifecycle, I think is what's gonna enable I, uh, you, you know, this 
this, these really cool solutions. So, I mean, we'd also seen in communities where they weren't asking the generic questions. Nobody was ever sourcing the problems. They were just asking, hey, do you support this solution? Like, where the heck did that solution even come from in the first place? And it's going to be what it needs to be is a continual dialogue from problem identification, crowdsourcing, brainstorming solutions, down selecting evidence and support, and then coming back and seeing if that fix. And if you do that, well, hardly anybody's doing that, that life cycle uh, in earnest. You do that once or twice and people see that their input informed throughout and caused an, imp caused an improvement, more people are going to join in that. I think it's just a, a, a beautiful picture uh, that emerges. Um, and so I think something in there is, is my hope, and that's our target at least, but that's the way we see it. So we're coming up on time, but I want to give Victoria and Colin a quick chance uh, to wrap up as well. Just a couple of sentences. Um, so I think that, yeah, so we need to use participatory democracy using technology to fix representative democracy. There is a lot of room for improvement and from there we will see when we go next and just to add one more thing on the table we need to think a lot about incentives that we are giving people to participate and really introduce this human-centered design in all these tools. I couldn't have put it better Victoria we can end there. Thank you all so much tremendous leaders in your own right uh, make sure you check out their work um, and really thank you all uh, for giving us great hope and inspiration and